On behalf of the Center for Middle East Studies, I'm um, you know, very honored and proud to uh, introduce to you the celebrated author and journalist Pankaj Mishra for a lecture titled The Remaking of Asia, What Does the Shift of Power from the West to the East Portend? And this talk is co-sponsored by the Center for China-United States Cooperation, the Asi Asian Studies Program, um, and the History Department here at the University of Denver. I do want to say just a brief word about the China Center. Um, when people ask us, what is the Center for Middle East Studies all about? What do you hope to aspire to? I often say we hope to emulate the really high quality work that the China Center has been producing. And if we can be half as successful and influential as Sam and the China Center, we will consider, we will consider the work of the Middle East to be a, uh, a raving success. Um, and so it's great that uh, we can co-sponsor um, a speaker today. And the fact that our speaker speaks both to the broader politics of the Middle East and the larger Islamic world, as well as having important things to say about China is really a reflection of the vast range and interest and influence of Pankaj Mishra. He's the author of several books, most recently from the Ruins of Empire, The Intellectuals Who Remade Asia, The Temptations of the West, How to Be Modern in India, Pakistan, Tibet, and Beyond, The End of Suffering, The Buddha in the World, and a novel called The Romantics. He's a fellow of the British Royal Society of Literature, and he divides his time between London and India, um, in particular, a small village in the Him Himalaya Mountains. Um, he's a columnist for Bloomberg View and a frequent contributor to influential publications such as the New York Review of Books, the London Review of Books, uh, the New Yorker, the Guardian. And he's also been recently named as one of the 100 top global thinkers of 2012 by Foreign Policy Magazine for charting in the magazine's own words the intellectual rise of the East without the West. And from his most latest book, The Ruins of Empire, which Pankaj was generous enough to share with me in manuscript form, uh, this book has been recently described as one of the best books of 2012 by The Economist, uh, The Financial Times, and The New Statesman. Uh, students who've taken my course in modern Islamic political thought know Pankaj Mishra because the first uh, section of his most recent book deals with one of the founding fathers of modern Islamic political thought, um, Jamal al-Din al-Afghani, who Pankaj has sort of revived and reminded us, reminded us of his important intellectual contributions. And I have to say, whenever I read Pankaj's writings, I'm sort of, I have a sense of deja vu. I'm reminded of reading some of the uh, uh, work and some of the influential intellectual insights and opinions of two people who've deeply shaped my generation when I was growing up. And I'm thinking specifically of the late Edward Said and the late Ekbal Ahmed. And I would situate Pankaj Mishra in this same genre of intellectuals who are deeply versed and connected to their own societies back in the East, but also deeply conversant, deeply fluent, and deeply engaged with intellectual conversations here in the West. And that's why I think someone like Pankaj is truly a global public intellectual uh, for students that are really trying to make sense of the world, who are interested in um, being exposed to a critical and insightful perspective about the world in which we live in. I strongly recommend you get to familiarize yourself with the writings of Pankaj Mishra. Um, you know, bookmark his website, get on his list server, uh, you will not be disappointed. Uh, the format for today is that Pankaj will speak for approximately 20 minutes. Um, then our uh, colleague here at Corbell, Haider Khan, will be a discussant. He will have some comments. I will facilitate a short exchange, and then we'll go to the audience for questions and answers. So without any further delay, please join, join me in welcoming to Corbell and the University of Denver, Pankaj Mishra. Th th thank you, Nader, um, for this very generous um, introduction, which um, I'm, of course, um, much happier to accept than the um, credentials bestowed upon me by Foreign Policy magazine. Um, I must actually confess to a um, certain awkwardness as I stand here, because I actually don't think of myself as an expert on international relations or expert of any kind. I don't even think of myself as a historian. Um, I think of myself fundamentally as a writer who works with insights gleaned from all realms of um, intellectual 
endeavor or creative endeavor, which means literature as much as uh, fiction, as much as history or sociology, uh, political science. Uh, and, and all this to arrive at certain views of a fast changing world, which are necessarily provisional because human knowledge is always growing and um, whether we know it or not, and constantly altering our most dearly held conceptions of the world. Uh, also have no particular national interest to promote or to protect, uh, no investment in any theory or concept like the clash of civilizations or uh, the clash, supposed clash between the West and the East. So from that slightly uh, sort of disinterested, or maybe non-partisan is a better word, uh, what I'm really fascinated by, interested in, is how most of us come to see the present, how most of us gauge the future, and more specifically, how knowledge about the outside world has been constructed in the United States, how soaked it has been by certain assumptions of power as it was disseminated across the public sphere by newspapers, periodicals of, of various sorts, think tanks, and how it has actually helped us uh, become, so, much of, so many of us, uh, become really blind to what's been happening in much of the world in the last century or so. In a book uh, that Nader was kind enough to mention that I recently published, I argued that the central event of the last century was the intellectual and political awakening of many, many Asian countries and their liberation from a very long period of Western hegemony, political, economic, cultural. And what we see in the world today, you look around um, the Arab Spring or the assertiveness of countries right from Turkey around all the way to China is basically you know, continuing of that process that started in the last century. Now, for most people in Europe and America, uh, they have a, they've have had a slightly different perspective, which is that for them, the 20th century was defined by the two world wars, and then the long standoff against an eventual victory over communism. The fact is that we still have uh, very little sense, um, even uh, much of academic scholarship has not been very clearly informed by how, for instance, many people in Java experienced the years of the Second World War, uh, not to mention how the Angolans saw the Cold War. But even if you take the dominant Western or the American perspective on this on the last century, or, or if you believe in this uh, triumphalist account of the rise of the West, um, we have to ask ourselves the question, what kind of knowledge has this produced? Has it really been an accurate guide to the world that we live in? In the post-war period, immediately after the Second World War, we witnessed the emergence of a whole industry of geopolitical speculation in this country. Foundations, research institutes, area studies departments in universities, and along with Along with all this, there emerged a whole class of professional um, experts, all dedicated to describing uh, this apparently extremely dangerous world we were living in. Um, I think that professionalization um, of intellectual endeavor on such a large scale created some massive problems, uh, like careerists everywhere, wherever they are, the professionals with degrees in international relations or history, uh, they tended to log roll. Much of their work uh, involved basically legitimizing their own employment. So for decades, they routinely exaggerated the Soviet Union's military and economic capabilities and the threat for, from communism. Even in the mid 80s, as late as that, few of them noticed that the Soviet Union was nearing collapse. Many, after the collapse, rushed to hail this new unipolar world in which America was supposedly the 
indispensable nation. Um, and then they started promoting free markets in, uh, in Russia and did not uh, anticipate this very rapid descent of Russia into gangster capitalism and the rise of uh, new forms of authoritarianism, which we see more clearly today. Many of these experts are still awaiting in China the arrival of liberal democracy, which I think accompanies the march of capitalism everywhere. And of course, I mean, uh, what many of these experts are looking for is basically a new paradigm that will transform policymaking at the highest levels and also boost their own careers. And you know, many of them um, have turned to promoting political Islam or Islam of fascism, new coinage as this new existential threat to Western civilization. But I think the last five years have been a really bewildering and confusing time for many of these policy intellectuals because they have suddenly realized they cannot avoid the prospect of American decline, something that was unthinkable if you cast your mind back to 2001, 2002, even after 9-11 when both globalization and the rise, you know, the empowering of the United States, the further empowerment, just seemed unstoppable. And even the, in the war in Iraq uh, seemed like a you know, very quick investment in a democratic future for the Middle East. The picture is very different today. The United States still has many, many more tanks, missiles, uh, aircraft carriers, warships than any other country, but we know that ragtag armies of insurgents in places like Iraq and Afghanistan successfully defied its military authority. Uh, the economic weaknesses have been even clearer, never more so in, in, in the last month or so in the, in, the, in the sort of drama around the edge of the so-called uh, fiscal cliff. Now, the mainstream responses to this fact, this unavoidable fact of decline, um, has been either, ah, let's have a new concert of democracies, again, sort of old ideas being refurbished over and over again, uh, and how the United States should assume leadership. And I'm quoting this from a book by Robert Kagan, extremely influential expert um, on the right, who wrote that the US should assume leadership of a united democratic bloc against the rising authoritarian powers of China and Russia. The fact is it's very hard to imagine today Xi Jinping or uh, Putin, for that matter, or any number of so-called enemies of the free world shivering at the thought of a concert of democracies. Uh, this, the, the, the resurrection of these really tired cliches just shows how the idea of American overreach and decline remains incomprehensible to many American elites, very painful for them to accept that. Even the more pragmatic, uh, slightly more realistic liberal internationalists, uh, people like uh, Farid Zakaria, for instance, who wrote back in 2003 in The New Yorker that America's dominance now seems self-evident. Fast forward to 2008. Uh, when he published his book, um, The Post-American World, where he reprinted this particular article, also these words, to be fair to him, but then added as a disclaimer, that was then. America remains the global superpower today, but it is an enfeebled one. What I find fascinating about this is that the retailing of illusions about by even those who actually accept that American power is not quite what it was. Uh, so according to Zakaria, the rise of the rest is a consequence of American ideas and actions. It's, I think it's worth reflecting on this narcissism uh, where the Herculean and often calamitous and tragic efforts of nation builders from Nehru to, to Mao, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, all across Asia, all these people have no place in this vision where the rise of the rest becomes a simple consequence of American ideas and actions. If you follow this vision, uh, it, you know, it becomes very clear that uh, basically what 
needs to really happen is countries like India and China and Brazil should be simply accommodated, the so-called rising rest, in this US-dominated international system. And you can give them memberships of clubs like, exclusive clubs like the G8, uh, maybe the Security Council of the United Nations. Um, countries like China may still remain very prickly challengers to American dominance in, in the Pacific but with the right kind of inducements, uh, democratic countries like India could be turned into an American ally. In fact, uh, last five, six years ago, uh, there was this orthodoxy around how the nuclear agreement that the Bush administration offered to India was going to make uh, India uh, what Zakaria called uh, this would bring India firmly and irrevocably onto the global stage as a major player and alter the strategic landscape. There was a lot of this kind of flag waving um, just, just months before the financial crisis, our countries are becoming more open, market friendly, democratic. All of this makes for extremely melancholy reading in 2013. So if there were people who really believed in the possibility of an international system that could be made more consensual, more peaceable by American-style capitalist modernity. It's no longer possible today. Um, you could argue that it's actually American-style capitalism that has helped severely disrupt the system, plunging entire societies into chaos, uh, first in East Asia, Southeast Asia, Latin America, and now in Europe and the United States. Those who trusted in this whole notion of global growth, which was gonna give us this massive bonanza of liberal democracy plus free markets, were basically updating modernization theory that so many of you would be familiar, familiar with that was extremely popular on uh, Ivy League campuses during the Cold War and I think continues to exercise a great and damaging influence. And you can find a cruder in version of that. Um, cruder versions of that exist everywhere, but most famously in Thomas Friedman's Golden Arches postulate, uh, which is basically that people privileged enough to be able to eat McDonald's burgers don't go to war with each other. But these panglosses of globalization ignore, uh, have ignored consistently, among many other things, that the fact that global growth still means nothing to much of the world's population. Some of whom, in fact most of whom, have their own ideas about how to organize their societies politically and economically. The militant Indians, the tribal Indians living in forests in central India who are fighting mining corporations and their allies the state, they don't seem very enamored of global growth. And mind you, even the beneficiaries of global growth, the biggest beneficiaries of global growth, are very far from signing up to a renewed project of American hegemony. Given the slightest opportunities, uh, China's masses express a fierce nationalism, which is rooted in very long, carefully sustained memories of humiliation by Western powers. And even the elites of these countries, of India or China uh, and, and, and many Southeast Asian countries, whose political edge might have been blunted by too many trips to Davos and uh, Aspen, are likely to credit their success to state-directed capitalism or simply resource extraction rather than to American ideas and actions, which, mind you, they would actually blame for the recent disasters of Western capitalism. The Arab Spring, the subsequent rise of Islamist parties in Egypt and Tunisia, the continuing mayhem in Syria, these are not the only events that have forced a rapid reconfiguration of American strategic choices. Hamas, uh, remember, boycotted and isolated after its election victories, bolder than ever before. Even Israel defies its American patrons in 
jaw-dropping ways, as we've seen in the last um, year or so. Massive bloodbath is in progress in Iraq, um, where uh, the biggest winners seem to have been Iran. The 700 billion war in Afghanistan ending in complete futility. Again, the biggest winners, not just the Taliban, but Pakistan, which dismissing American protests, receiving American money, has been striking various deals with the Taliban in Afghanistan. The nuclear deal with India has amounted to very little. It wasn't the bonanza it was widely expected to, to be for American businessmen or the armaments industry. American concessions in global warming um, have not prompted any generous offers from India and China, whose determination to protect their farmers have helped also uh, stymie the um, Doha trade negotiations. Tough talk, very little impression on Iran, uh, also on North Korea, which has had to be appeased with uh, Chinese uh, assistance and still keeps launching rockets. They've announced yet another uh, project today, despite sanctions. And China increasingly appears to have more influence over many African countries than any Western power at this point, including the United States. The territorial disputes between China and its neighbors may make American military buffers in East Asia look very, very important. But we also know that the United States at this point can barely pay for this so-called pivot to Asia. And how it comes about, whether it comes about, that's also an open question. Its old ally in the region, Australia, is setting out its own independent path, which is increasing cooperation with China, which happens to be the biggest trading partner, not just Australia, but almost all Asian countries with which China has had major territorial disputes. Mali, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, Maghreb, various parts of Africa where um, the Europeans, uh, the British and the French feel they have a stake in fighting Islamic fundamentalism and they're complaining practically every day that the United States is doing nothing or not helping them enough in combating this threat. What I'd want to ask, uh, what do these developments really point to? It's always risky to speculate about the future. But if, if one is to look at the present and uh, point to something that is happening very slowly, perhaps, just the barest outlines, I would say it is the emergence of a new international system where America is far from being the indispensable nation that can place what it needs to do ahead of all other national interests, either through brute power or by striking postures of consultation and cooperation. What we're seeing now is a world with a multiplicity of national power centers with conflicting interests and values. One can only hope that it will eventually find its own equilibrium, one less precarious than the so-called order maintained by the imperial powers of Europe and America in the last two centuries. The rise of the rest, uh, if one has to call, this, call it this, will also correct what George Kennan, the great diplomat and thinker, in his last years defined as this whole tenzin tendency to see ourselves as a center of political enlightenment and as teachers to a great part of the rest of the world. Unthought through, vainglorious, and undesirable is how Kennan described it. The vast majority of the world's population has never really disagreed with this description, Kennan's description. What remains to be seen is whether the institutions, the individuals devoted to producing professionally an accurate view of the world can redefine their assumptions of power, which were disastrous enough and misleading enough when the US was very powerful, but are dangerously misleading when US power is in decline. 
Thank you. Well, thank you, Nadir, and others uh, uh, for organizing this. Uh, and thank you for such a wonderful talk, uh, uh, concise, precise, uh, and to the point. Uh, uh, I um, uh, would like to mention, uh, by the way, uh, as uh, Nadir did, uh, that his book is truly um, a, a wonderful book. Uh, full of wonders. That's the that's the sense in which I use the adjective. Um, and uh, uh, if you want to read it in a structured situation, you should take my course in the spring on global poverty and human rights, uh, for which this will be one of the required books. Um, <clears throat> so um, I suppose you know that's probably the most sincere compliment one can pay uh, uh, to a book and and the author of the book to really use it. Um, I want to uh, begin by uh, 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 just uh, asking one particular question about uh, Liang, uh, one of the figures in, in the book, uh, and then move to uh, maybe geopolitics, geoeconomics, and, and other things, uh, including <coughs> a few things about language. Um, uh, uh, and we have here, uh, uh, or we had, uh, my colleague, Professor Zhao, who has written a whole book on, on Chinese nationalism, so he would know more. <clears throat> but uh, uh, some uh, scholars, uh, uh, like Liu Kang, for example, uh, uh, when they talk about China, they uh, uh, present it as a very complex revolutionary or post-revolutionary uh, um, socioeconomic formation. Uh, and in this, nationalism ends up being a rather complex phenomenon than uh, it is usually understood, uh, uh, either, either uh, in the West, uh, so-called, or in uh, uh, the so-called nationalist historical literature, which pe people like Pandikar, for example, started in India. Uh, so what are some of the complexities um, uh, in, in Chinese nationalism today? Um, uh, some people even say there are elements of postmodernism in China. Um, uh, and I know you have studied this fairly closely, so that's one question that I think uh, uh, I would want to pose. Uh, <clears throat> having posed that, let me uh, broach the issue of, of language. Um, uh, one of the other figures in your book, uh, Jamaluddin al-Afghani, <coughs> wrote, um, uh, and this gives you a flavor, some flavor even in translation about uh, the force of his prose. Uh, uh, he says, <clears throat> there is no community without a language. No language without a culture, which is the word for it is Adab. No honor without history, and no history for a nation if there is no one to preserve the contribution of their great men. The maintenance of the language, culture, and honor of a community depends solely on the education of one's own country, which is Talim e Watan, based in one's fatherland for the sake of the fatherland, irrespective of religious or other differences among the people. And this is very uh, important, the last uh, 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 phrase, uh, that he was much more than just a pan-Islamist, um, and, and that is something very important. Uh, I am struck, of course, always by the irony that uh, you know uh, we are both speaking English here, uh, and their pragmatics aside, uh, that in itself raises a lot of questions. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, and if there is sometimes uh, a, a kind of uh, sense of frustration and even bitterness uh, uh, in the writings of. Uh, 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 people from what sometimes are called post-colonial societies, uh, uh, it perhaps may be attributed to the complexities of, of this uh, situation that uh, we are put on. And uh, um, uh, the third figure in, uh, in Pankaj's book is Rabindranath Tagore, on whom probably I have done more work. Uh, 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 <clears throat> uh, but uh, Faiz Ahmad Faiz, who is a great poet uh, uh, of Urdu literature uh, and world literature, and uh, also, uh, I think in some respects, uh, a greater poet than Tagore. Uh, he expresses this very, very well in one of his poems. Uh, and I'll read, read you the Urdu version um, uh, first. Uh, uh, he says uh, uh, in this couplet, par hai talkhiye maya ayam verna faiz, hum talkhiye kalam par mayal zarana thi. And uh, <coughs> in plain English, I had only a few minutes to translate this. Uh, uh, it is, 
my lips, Fez, have tasted the bitter wine of life. I was not by temperament given to a bitter style. So I want you to really grasp emotionally to the extent you can and empathetically the situation in which uh, intellectuals like us are really put <laughs> in trying to communicate, in trying to understand, in trying to understand that the, the treachery called history, uh, which Lamartan, uh, uh, a politician and a poet uh, uh, from 1848, actually called uh, a trick <laughs> that the living play upon the dead. But the uh, uh, dead can also play tricks upon the, upon the living, um, as uh, uh, the writings on history, philosophy of history, by a figure no less than Hegel. Uh, would indicate. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and uh, we are actually seeing history in the making. Uh, the world is changing, and it's indeed very complicated. And as Pankaj uh, told us, uh, uh, the uh, uh, ideas uh, that have been suppressed, uh, especially ideas of people like uh, Jamaluddin Afghani uh, of Tagore, and for those who know more about uh, uh, China and Liang, uh, idea of Liang even, uh, although I think there are more complex uh, factors at work there, I think, uh, and we'll hear from Pankaj soon. Uh, we, we need to find what is living and what is dead in, this, in these people's ideas and how they illuminate the complexities of our time. And uh, we need to, uh, most of all, understand how a uh, view of history from above, uh, whether it is done in the West, uh, in the imperialist mode, uh, or uh, usually in the liberal imperialist mode, um, uh, or uh, uh, in the so-called East, uh, 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 repeating the formula in, in one form or another, even in oppositional terms uh, uh, of the ruling classes uh, of their own and uh, uh, from, from the West. Uh, and so uh, without taking up too much time, um, uh, I actually uh, had a few remarks uh, um, uh, which uh, uh, lead uh, uh, his reading his book actually led me to compare uh, the Irish national movement uh, uh, and and especially writings of people like Joyce and Yeats uh, uh, um, uh, at, uh, during the early part of the 20th century uh, and especially Joyce in his creating a language uh, in in Ulysses towards the end and Finnegan's Wake of really, really subverting, perverting even, of the, the English language, the language of the, of the conqueror uh, um, from uh, a, a peculiar vantage point uh, that only, I think, people who genuinely suffer can have. Um, and this is no rationalization. Um, uh, but uh, we really need to uh, work hard uh, on this. And uh, before I pose some questions and, and finish this short intervention, uh, let me just mention um, uh, something from Ranajit Guha, who is a uh, great pioneer um, uh, in modern subaltern history. And his, his work really is a classic um, <coughs> about the movements from below in India, the peasant, peasant revolts. Uh, uh, he, uh, uh, in one of the books that uh, actually were originally a set of lectures uh, at Columbia University, refers to something called Alazon complex, uh, a, a literary term introduced by the critic Northrop Frye, uh, as someone who pretends or tries to be something more than he is. <clears throat> and uh, these, of course, uh, can be uh, great delusions uh, shared both uh, by leaders from the metropolitan countries and leaders uh, from um, uh, the periphery and semi-periphery. Um, um, uh, and uh, uh, they are indeed very dangerous and ultimately uh, uh, self-defeating. And uh, in Guha's uh, words, uh, these um, uh, kind of discourses tend to produce historical accounts in which the nationalism of the colonized competes with metropolitan imperialism in its bid to uphold the primacy of the state. And Guha's expression, uh, which I borrow here, is the pathos of exclusion, is exactly right, as uh, is his spirit of autocritique, that as uh, an intellectual writing from that vantage point, you still need an autocritic. You need to have self-criticism. Uh, <clears throat> and in Tagore, uh, 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 what really stands out more than the others uh, is the honest expression of an attempt to come to terms 
with the logic and pathos of such exclusion. Like a nightmare <coughs> from which we, the colonial subjects, like Joycean characters are trying to awaken, history stands as both a trap and a bridge. Tagore's own solution was to individualize everyday events through an exercise of one's own feminine creative spirit. That road is still open to us, but what are the political, social, economic conditions under which this becomes a possibility for all? This politically Buddhist question that tore apart the social and political fabric of Brahmanic India long before Europe's rise was posed again by Marx under capitalism, which now has morphed into capitalist imperialism. Marx posed it in the spirit of the revolutionary side of Hegel that Hegel himself had abandoned. It is perhaps not just naive romanticism to think that only through authentic acts of intellectual and political revolts, individually and collectively, that we come to realize our common humanity. That is to say, like Joyce's Stephen and Tagore's Gora, we make ourselves historically human by asserting our creative spirit against the dead hand of oppression. And when this is done in the true spirit of Tagore's unity of the East and West with a Joycean shout from the street, only then can we begin to go beyond the crisis of civilization, which was Tagore's response to the rise of fascism. So let me just pose a few questions at the end. Uh, um, Pankos talks about a new system, but uh, uh, what kind of system? Or are we really going through a period of chaotic transition? and perhaps with even rise of local uh, uh, or even global fascism. Uh, and what is living and what is dead in these thinkers that might help us sort this out. Uh, what about the collusion and collaboration between the imperialist ruling classes uh, uh, <clears throat> in at least Japan, India, and China, uh, even if we don't subscribe uh, fully to the thesis of transnational ruling class that people like uh, William Robinson and Sclair have put forth? And uh, uh, finally, uh, what are the roles of classes, social movements, uh, in this emerging history of Asia? Uh, in other words, what must a historiography from below look like? And uh, you mentioned the Leith movement, for example, and there are many other movements in India and other places. So if you could touch upon those things in your response, that I think would help us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I just wonder whether we should leave the Liang question to maybe yeah. lunch, because a lot of people here may not be familiar with the book or with, the, um, with, with, with this very important historical figure. Um, let's, should we go straight to um, the um, question? Well, it may, I think it may well be that we are in, the, uh, we, we are in transition to a darker time than we have known in the last uh, five, six decades. Um, certainly, many, there are many instances now, whether it's India or Pakistan, Israel, um, Thailand, um, Indonesia to a lesser extent, where one sees the assertion, um, sometimes militant, of um, authoritarian minded forces, political forces. Often they seem to be very close to capturing state power. And all this has been happening, uh, which may be answering all your three questions together, along with uh, realignment of social forces internally, where the elites, the beneficiaries of global capitalism over the last two decades or so are finding themselves besieged and turning sometimes to older narratives of national greatness, uh, such is at least partly the case in, in, um, in, 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 in China. Also, in India, the invocation of Hindu nationalism and also the, um, the, the a lot which, which goes along with rampant privatization and uh, large-scale uh, sale of national resources, land, mobile spectrum, name it. So the rise of authoritarianism 
uh, along with the assertion, increasing assertion and social conflict in many of these countries where uh, large parts of the population are rebelling against these conditions of inequality, these very degrading conditions that they've been living in for the last 10, 15 years, and they've been promised the fruits of globalization, which haven't arrived, and it seems like they will never arrive, and the frustration and the anger that is spilling over into militant movements or sometimes in rising crime rates across large parts of <coughs> Asia. That, uh, as a response to that, what we see now is the state asserting itself, and, and of course the people who control the levers of the state who are the greatest beneficiaries of this growing authoritarianism of the state. So uh, in, 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 uh, in, in, in other words, an extremely complex situation developing, which is not going to be explained, as I said earlier, by these older binaries of North and South or East versus West, we be moving into a much, much more uh, complex situation where uh, there is the likelihood of uh, conflicts not just between rising, competing nation states in South Asia or, so or Southeast Asia or East Asia for that matter, but also conflicts of um, great intensity within these nation states, uh, within you know, different and, and, and sort of new classes, uh, you know, particularly classes of people, large masses of people that have traveled, that have migrated in many instances to the large cities of India, for instance, who find themselves now um, completely stranded in terms of the modern world hasn't really delivered in, on, its, on its promises of jobs, of security, of the excitements of metropolitan life. And they've also been unanchored uh, from home in terms of the sort of subsistence economies they were part of, uh, in many cases, they have collapsed. So they, can, they cannot really go back and life in these, these, these sort of urban conglomerations is hellish for most of them. Um, so I think we're going to see more and more violence um, emerging from within these very large groups of people. And we're already seeing that, we're seeing that happen. Uh, more and more in, in, in places like India. We see that in, in places like Jakarta, where you know, it's, if, if it's a Muslim country, it quickly assumes, the, uh, assumes a different tone and color, at least in the international reporting of it. We suddenly start talking about religious extremism rather than you know, socio-economic conflicts. But we see that all across uh, you know, large parts of um, Asia. So I think, um, I mean, to basically agree with you in a, a roundabout way. I think we are in, 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 in sort of process of transitioning to a much more complicated and, and bewildering era where so many of our older uh, landmarks uh, through which we have kind of basically found our place or defined our place in the world, uh, they would be rendered utterly useless. Let's open the floor. Thank you both, uh, Haider and Pankaj. Let's open the floor to questions, comments. Uh, yeah, at the back.
Yes, absolutely. Th thank you very much. Uh, the, the question really is uh, events like the, uh, the, the this horrific uh, uh, assault on a young woman in, in Delhi last month, which got a lot of attention, both domestically within India and internationally, and how events like that, which galvanize a lot of people, which politically awaken a lot of people, might be counted as positive factors. Is that is that yeah, the correct yeah, account? Maybe, you know, maybe there are more opportunities for the rest to, um, I don't know, talk back to the elite. Yes. Um, and I know, I, I, and I agree with that. I, you know, it's it's very difficult to disagree with that. In fact, at the same time, there is a but there. The fact is that what the story did was disrupt this narrative of the elites of the last five seven years. This seamless narrative of India rising, this uh, story which was never going to end until the moment India surpassed China and maybe even the United States. Uh, which was being fed to us by not only people who stood to benefit most directly from it, in foreign investors in India, or the businessmen in India who were ready to receive that kind of investment, or the foreign journalists who could thereby get front page stories in the New York Times if they reported that aspect of India, or any number of Indian journalists who could go to the parties of foreign journalists and be counted as great experts. So there was a real synergy at work there in creating this particular narrative, completely uncomplicated, unproblematic, which excluded everything that had been happening in India in the last 20 years, not just the brutal treatment of women in large parts of India, but also the insurgency in, in Kashmir, in the northeastern states, the militant uh, insurgency now in central India. So I think that narrative has been questioned like never before in the last month or so. And I think most people around the world have come to a slightly more accurate understanding of what is really happening in India today, how the culture of aspiration, which could bring a young woman like, uh, like her out of her village into the big city, how that can end so tragically. Now, this is a situation described again and again in the great literature of the European 19th century and indeed the great American literature of the early 20th century. We haven't had that kind of literature coming out of India. Or, or, or if there is, we don't, we're not aware, enough aware of, uh, of, of those stories. So that has certainly, you know, and, and I think one cannot stress enough the importance of non-defective knowledge like that to circulate, how important it is. And, and m much of my talk was about how bad knowledge circulates and the factors that help it circulate. And so something like that, that produces, that introduces a new narrative into the world is, you know, is, is I think, as you say, a positive thing. And also, you know, it makes it possible for a lot of people in India to feel that they've been directly affected or could be directly affected if this goes on. If they come out in the streets and demonstrate. All of this is positive. At the same time, I think for real change to happen, on the ground, so many other things have to change in India, internally, also internationally. The particular economic models that we are following, uh, dominantly, predominantly one of rampant urbanization, creating these large uh, slummer policies around the world, large parts of Asia, where, you know, for instance, you know, majority of the populations of places like New Delhi or Bombay live in essentially slums. Um, where people living there are being consistently, routinely brutalized to the point where, you know, the, this, this particular existence that they've been promised um, that, you know, urban life gives off better opportunities uh, in all, all sort of endeavors of all realms of human life, this particular promise uh, for so many people has proven to be so tragically false. And that, the kind of anger and frustration it generates among so many people. I mean, I sense in places like Delhi such a, such a lot of simmering anger around me. How is one going to deal with that? You could have legislation of all kinds. Maybe you could have the capital, you could have hanging or capital punishment for rapists. But we know that's not going to stop this. 
um, that we need you know, much, much larger measures. We need to rethink uh, the, way, the way on which we've kind of premised our future, um, the, the particular models of economic growth, of, of, of political unity that uh, we've sort of invested in over the, over the decades. Where are they taking us? And I think those larger questions have to be asked, um, and not just you know, this uh, middle class awakenings, which, mind you, often turn out to be little media creations. Something else happens, and we quickly move on to that. And then we quickly move on to something else. Just in the last two years, there have been two or three major events, which were also greeted as harbingers of a great middle class awakening. And then they all collapsed. And it turned out that the media had been inflating them all along. And in, in media, again, which has a great stake in exaggerating these events, uh, because their ratings go up all the time. Great, thanks. OK, we have time for a few more questions. Yes, right there. Technology is a. Restate the question. Oh, yes. Um, the question is about um, technology, more specifically mobile phones, and what way can they also help transform the landscape? More people have access to it. More people have access to it. And uh, the fact is that actually there are about 925 million mobile phone subscribers in India today, and more Indians have access to mobile phones than to working toilets, which is also a fact to consider. Um, so the question is about mobile phones, and in what way can they um, expedite um, you know, political events like the one at uh, Barrier Square? Of course they can. And the fact is that uh, you know, without mobile phones, it would have been very hard to imagine, not just Barrier Square, but any number of political <coughs> movements in India in the last uh, three or four years or so. Um, so it's really only around 2005 that mobile phones took off in a big way when cheap prepaid calls became possible. So mobile phones had been around, but many people knew of them, but they thought they were unaffordable. And suddenly, you know, there was this idea that they actually become very cheap. And so uh, now we have hundreds of millions of people using those mobile phones. But mobile phones are a tool, and you can put them to a variety of uses. You know, so you can use them to stage, to host a demonstration in the heart of New Delhi um, and create an extremely impressive gathering of people angered, outraged by uh, this, this horrific um, assault on, on the young woman. You can also use mobile phones like they were used late last year in uh, Bangalore using text messages, threatening text messages, messages to migrant workers from the northeastern states and telling them there's going to be massive retaliatory attacks on them by Muslims in South India and they better leave town. And thousands and ten tens of thousands of them actually did leave town based on what was essentially an extremely malicious rumor, a conspiracy to get those people out of Bangalore. So there's that other use of mobile phone. So I don't think they're good or bad in themselves. It's you know, very much up to the person who's, who's, who's sort of using them and uh, to what, what, what kind of uses they would put that mobile phone to. I do think it has allowed a degree of communication and between and across classes and hierarchies of the kind that didn't um, exist before. You know, the fact that you can dial certain people and there are engineers, for instance, in my village, like the sort of guy who repairs the, uh, who's in charge of the phone connection of BSNL, he has a mobile phone, it's advertised on the website, so you can call him 
in the way I could never. I could never get a hold of him on a landline. But now I just have to make a single call and he will pick it up if it's uh, within office hours. Um, so that kind of access has uh, obviously become possible. But I think uh, you know, there were earlier forms of connectedness like the rail, the roadways, um, the telegraph, which helped the British, who originally set them up in India, control this administrative unit, which they call India. It came very useful to them. It came very useful, of, obviously, to the post-colonial elites who supplanted them in controlling this vast territory. What we have to see now is whether mobile phones, which is a new form of connectedness, instant connectedness, whether it's a tool for unity or cohesive action, or whether it's something very disruptive, especially in the context of India today, which is a very unequal, highly volatile society, you know, where, as Naipaul put it so brilliantly in 1990, a country of a million mutinies. And what role do mobile phones play where these million mutinies are playing out? That remains to be seen. Okay, I think that's um, going to be it for today. We need to get Pankaj to his next appointment. Let me thank Pankaj Mishra for traveling all the way from England um, to be with us today, to share with us uh, his insights. Let me thank um, Haider Khan for his contribution to the success of today's event. And let me thank the audience for your questions and comments. Thanks.